never kept up with the current um, addresses and phone numbers and email and all that stuff. So we are asking you, if you didn't do it last week, that this week you can take a moment to fill out your connection card. And we need your name and your address and your phone number. We need your birthday. You don't have to give us a year, just a day. Uh, and then we also need your email address. So your kids' names, you want to put those down. Uh, it's just our, we won't do anything with this, but keep it to ourselves. It's just our way of being able to contact you. We had to uh, send out some tithe, tithe um, by the way, if you didn't get your tithing record, see Brian or one of the board members afterwards, and we'll make sure they get those to you. Uh, but we can't find some of the addresses of people that have, that have just been here. Uh, we didn't do a good job of making sure that information was up to date. So we're updating our database, and if you could all make sure that you give us that information, so that you're in there. We don't give it to anybody. We don't sell it. Uh, if somebody calls and wants your number, we will always call you first to get permission. Uh, that's just how we, we operate. That's what we do, because we want to make sure your privacy is maintained uh, as much as it possibly can be. So uh, please fill those out if you have it, so we have that information. If you have a prayer request, please do that as well. If you want to become a member of the church, I've got, we went from three to, I think, eight that want to become members of the church. I, I have to contact with all of you, but I will. Uh, I will get to you. Uh, I've just been a little crazy with some other stuff happening, but, but I will get to you and let you know and, and talk to you about how that looks and how it works and how it functions. So, But if you want to become a member of the church, I encourage you to check that little box uh, that's that's in the connection card. So I, that's how I keep track of who's wants what. And uh, so I appreciate that as well. So let's pray this morning. Oh, by the way, if you haven't filled out a faith promise pledge yet for the year, uh, that's just permissions giving. There are some at the back of the table. We encourage you to do that and then simply drop it in the end or the offering basket as it comes along. But let's pray. Lord, thank you for being amazing. Thank you for the worship we just had. I pray it doesn't end because of music ends. I pray that our heart is still in tune with you, that we are constantly living in a tune of worship before you. And I pray that even as we give, that this giving is, a, is an act of worship before you. Some, Lord, I know have struggled, but this will be an act of faith to trust you today to say, God, if I give this to you, well, I have enough left over. God, you have never, ever disappointed or failed me in that regard. You have always been a God who provides. And, but Lord, we pray that today, this act of worship where we give to you, that you would receive it under our hearts of, of gladness to give, and also, Father, under the knowing that as we give to you, you will bless it to further your kingdom. So now we thank you for this. We thank you for your love and our love now being reflected back to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 As the guys, I guess they're all guys this morning, as the guys are collecting this morning, just a couple other things. The uh, Amy would like to meet with all the people that are doing children's church. If you're teaching children's church, teachers and helpers. She's got a quick little thing she wants to do. She's not taking to take much of your time. But after church, where do you want them to be? In the first, in the meeting room, right? In the meeting room, just yeah. to the left as you leave. Uh, if you could just meet there with her, she just needs about five minutes of not even that, uh, just to get you caught up on some things that are happening. And, and uh, so if you're part of that, please see, please see Amy after the, the service this morning. Youth group, that apparently there's some football game on today. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're aware of that. And, uh, but we like the Super Bowl, we like to watch it. And uh, so we're moving the youth group up from, from instead of 5 to 6.30, it's going to be from 3.30 until 5. And that way they can be home and watch the game or whatever they want to do. So we have youth group are like, yay! And uh, so we're going to work doing that just also so we can watch the game too. And uh, we're, we're really doing it for them. Um, Keep job ministry if you pray uh, in your prayers this month of February, because that's his, uh, we picked up a new month, and Pastor Charlie graciously decided he wanted to and was willing to do that. And uh, so God bless them as they do that. But continue to keep them in prayer if you will pray in just a, a second. But um, it's the only other thing that I have is this little card in my hand called Marriage Matters. Um, Justine and I have committed a lot of time. To get this prepared and uh, for you, uh, even almost past my bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
I might have been sleeping as, as a villain. I'm like, what did you say? I'm falling asleep and then trying to put all this together. But, but we believe marriage does matter. And uh, we're going to talk about that starting tomorrow night. And it's going to go for five weeks. And we're going to cover some topics like seeking God, fighting fair, having fun, staying pure, and then never giving up. Amen. And that's going to be the, the five nights that we're going to have. And we believe it's going to equip you and empower you and bless you and anoint you and strengthen you and equip you to have a marriage that's greater than it's ever been. Yes. And not only that, but our goal is literally to make sure that your marriages are divorce proof. Yes. That's really what we're looking for. And uh, so we want to encourage you to come and be part of that, invite others to come. Uh, we had some of these cards made up so you could invite people. And uh, so there's, I think there's 50 on the table back there. Uh, don't take more than what you need, but whoever you think you're going to invite, I would encourage you to take one of these cards. Maybe it's a family member, a co-worker, um, whoever it is, we encourage you to take some and hand those out. Uh, you know, because marriages really, truly really matter. And I don't care how good your marriage is, it can be better. Amen. I guarantee you it can be better. As strong as our marriage is, it can be better. And uh, we have to rely on the Holy Spirit. We have to work on the, rely on the work of God to do those things. And we have to be willing uh, to be molded into that image of God to make sure, right, that it's working the way God wants it to work. And uh, so we encourage you to come and be part of that. It's only for five weeks, and it's only for an hour. It's only from six to seven. Child care is graciously being provided during that hour as well. So as far as I'm concerned, you have no excuse not to be here. Because I'm sure, I, if you prayed right now and said, Jesus, do you want me to come and work on my marriage? I can tell you what he's going to say. Yes. He's going to say yes. You say, well, what if, what if my spouse can't make it, but I can? Then come. Work on you. But be here. we will say, well, I, can't, I can make it three nights, but I can't make it all five. Then come three nights. Come as often as you can. Stay as long as you can, right? But, but come, make a commitment to, to come to be here. And I believe it's important. And I don't know what else you've got going on, but I would say your, your marriage is pretty important. I'll tell you this, you know, some people say, well, I can't come because my kids got stuff. One day your kids are going to be gone. Yes. And you're going to have to tell them. And you need to work on your marriage. Because when the kids are gone, you're still married. Right? Because I get tired of people coming into my office and saying, well, the kids are gone, and now it's just the two of us, and we don't even know each other. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. And that is wrong. Yeah. So, um, somebody asked me this morning, how many, we know how many people are coming. I said, we really don't. But I, I said, but I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Just to get some idea. You would come around and look. So you can give everybody the evil eye. That's no. How many of you are planning on attending the, the marriage matters? Yeah. yeah, you talk to the rest of them about the hand raised. You know what? I'll tell you this. If you're not married or thinking about getting married, then you need to come. Because it'll help you. That would be a little weird for Titus to do that. That's true. But he'll come. He'll be here. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have. So we're going to dismiss the kids at Children's Church. God bless them as they go. For the rest of you old people, grab your Bibles if you would. Grab your phones. Grab your phones. And don't go to Facebook. Go to the Bible app. I see, sometimes I tell people, you know, pull out your phones and go to the Bible app, and some of the things you're doing, I'm thinking, that's not on the Bible app. This, the Bible app does not require any of this. Oh, you're taking notes. Okay. And they're either playing games, or they're doing messages, or they're, yeah. God is amazing, isn't he? Yesterday we had the, uh, we had the honor of going through my mom's stuff because we're moving her upstairs to the uh, skilled nursing facility. And uh, so she had to abandon her, her apartment. 
And we're going through all kinds of stuff, and of course, bringing back a lot of a lot of memories. And uh, we were upstairs. My brother and I were upstairs for a while, and we came back down. And we were hiding for a little while, <laughs> and, but we came back down, and somebody found a picture. Uh, the apparently I drew in first grade. Nobody knew what it was. I didn't know what it was. And it's because they had it upside down. And I said, well, if you turn it over, it says my name. Can you read the letters? Yeah, not this way, but it's still my name. And uh, we opened up on the inside, there's a picture of my, my class. My first grade class, and I can remember any of them except for one guy standing next to me, who seems to be, every time I pull out an old picture from first or second or third grade, this guy is always standing next to me, whether it's first communion or whether it's a class picture. And when they handed it to me, he said, well, we found you. And I said, do you know who's standing next to me? I no, Bob Moss. <laughs> And I thought that was so cool, and I thought, you know, here's a guy who's still standing next to me in the ministry, right? That's a good friend, isn't it? And I was thinking about sharing that, I forgot that he was going to share that, because that's just pretty cool. I mean, here's my, my elder of the church, still standing next to me, supporting me in, in ministry. And then, you know, God said to me, he said, that's really cool. He said, but can I remind you of something? He says, I've always been next to you as well. I said, thank you Lord, for that. And uh, not, to, to, not to belittle what Bob has done. But I'm sorry, God trumps all of that. I said, thank you, Lord, for, for reminding me. Well, you know that, uh, and I love the songs that we sang this morning, because it truly does remind us of the fact that we have a commission and a job that we're supposed to be doing. Right? And, and we know what that is, and that's our focus for the year. Our vision for the year, that's literally focus, F-O-C-U-S. We're going to fulfill our commission united by the Spirit of God. And we have to do that. We have to be about God's business. Uh, three, four weeks ago, I don't remember how long it's been then, and we sent out the email. Diana sent me this really cool email about one of her friends uh, that saw a bunch of cows walking in the field. And it's funny because the cows were all lined up. And God spoke to her and says, this is how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be following me. I should be your lead. And of course she said she had to pull over that day and, and it was in that moment that she gave her life to Jesus. Oh, wow. That's like, God, only you can use a cow, right? A frozen turkey, a donkey, you know, to lead people to you. How amazing is that? Because God is on the move. And what she said to me, what Diana reminded me of this morning was really cool. She said, she had been talking to a friend and her friend said to her, uh, about, you know, now that I'm a new Christian, where should I start reading the Bible? Of course, we always say, you start with the book of John. Because John understood who Jesus was. And so you, you direct them to go to John. Read John first. So you get an idea, so you know who is this guy that saved you? Yes. What he's all about? But her friend said, to her, just, I'm reading Revelations. <laughs> <laughs> no, we never tell anybody. <laughs> To read Revelations after they get saved. Not immediately anyway. But you know what she said? This was amazing. She said she felt like she had to because she said, God told me he's coming back soon. She goes, and I want to be ready and I want to know what it looks like. I said, that is awesome. Because isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that our focus for this year? I believe in all of my heart Jesus is coming back soon. I believe it could be before the service is over this morning. And the fact is, we talked all last year about the fact that we should be watching and praying and being ready for his return. And the fact is, here's a brand new Christian who got saved because of cows walking in a field, reading the book of Revelations because she says she believes in her heart that God's coming back soon. What a great reminder for us, amen? Yes. Reminds me of the story that the little girl was driving home with her parents and she was sitting in the back seat of her car and she goes, Mom and Dad, I got some questions. She goes, I didn't understand some of the stuff that the pastor said this morning. She goes, the pastor said that God is so big that he can hold the whole world in his hands. She goes, is that true? And mom and dad said, yeah, that's, that's true. But then she goes, later the pastor said that, that if we ask him, God will come and live inside of our hearts. She goes, is that true too? And they go, yeah, that's true too. And she said, well, if God is so big, 
and we invite him in our heart, should he shine through? Should people see him if he's that big and living in us? Now that that is true. And that's part of what you need to do when we talk about evangelism, when we talk about sharing your faith. You should be living in a way that God is shining through. If God who created the universe, if God who can hold the, in the palm of his hand the entire world, if he's living in you, he ought to be shining through. I love that. And who better to relate to us how to do evangelism to Jesus? And so I want to talk to you at this point about Jesus evangelism and, and how Jesus did it so that we can look at how we should do it. I really want to just look at one story to that. That's, of course, in the Samaritan woman. So if you grab your Bibles and go to John, in the fourth chapter of the book of John, we're going to look at verses 1 to 14. We're going to look how Jesus did evangelism, how Jesus shared the good news with, with this woman and how important it was to her and, and the, the criteria we can use when we go to talk with people. So let's pray over the word this morning. Father, thank you so much for being an amazing God. Thank you for reminding us that you are returning soon. And thank you, Lord, for giving us uh, your scriptures to remind us, Lord, how we should do what it is we should be doing. And I pray today, Lord, that as this word is read, that it wouldn't just be a story we've heard before, but it would be a challenge to what we should do as we leave these four walls and go back to our homes and our communities and our workplaces. And so, Lord, would you take this word, would you anoint it? Would you bless it beyond blessing? Would you hide it in our hearts? And Father, as always, that we would never just be knowing your word, but we would be doing your word. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. John chapter 4, starting with the first one, it says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. And it was near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now his disciples had gone into town to buy food, so they went with him. But the Samaritan woman said to him, uh, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that you asked for, drink, for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than... Then our father Jacob, who gave us this well, who drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. And Jesus answered, he said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks my water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So we have this great story of this woman's encounter with this, with Jesus' encounter with this Samaritan woman. And he talks about a woman who's lost all hope. He's talking about a woman, it's, it's noon. Noon is not a good time to fetch water. We saw depictions of this in, in Haiti when we were there. If you wanted to go fetch water, you fetched it early in the morning or late in the evening, when it was cooler. But we look at this and it's, I think it's, you know, when John has a reason why he points out it was noon. It was noon when this was happening. Because it wasn't a good time to be outside. It wasn't a good time to be fetching water. But if she would have done it any other time, she would have had to come face to face and meet the other women who were out fetching water at the same time. You see, this woman that Jesus encountered was the bad girl of the community. She's the one who everybody knew. She's the one who had the reputation. Uh, she's not married. Matter of fact, the, the man she's currently living with wasn't married. She's been married five times. And five times she's tried to start over. Five times she's tried to start a new life. 
five times, and now she's given up. She's given up on marriage. She's given up on happiness. She's given up on hope. And she's not turning back. She's not going to find a new start. She feels like there's no new beginnings. She accepted the fact that, the, the fact that she is an outcast in her society, and she's learned to live without hope. Now here's Jesus on his way through Samaria, and he strikes up a conversation with this woman. Now in those times, it was not politically correct for Jews to have conversations with Samaritans, especially if they were a woman. So her first strike is, Jesus, she's a Samaritan, or she's a, she's a woman, and you're having a conversation with him. Jewish men, as horrible as this sounds, Jewish men felt like it was better off to talk to a dog than to talk to a woman. That was just the perception of the day. That was their, it was not scriptural, but that was their attitude. And yet here's Jesus striking up this conversation with a Samaritan woman. Now Samaritans were considered half-breeds to the Jews. Because when the king of Assyria was there and, and uh, took over the region, uh, some of these Jews of the Samaritans literally became, the Samaritans were considered a half-breed. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And uh, so here comes Jesus, meeting the Samaritan, meeting the woman, but first two strikes, but she also was what they would consider the chief sinner of the community. So with most of us, we think, well, she's a woman, she's a Samaritan, she's a sinner, three strikes and you're out, right? Not with Jesus. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't keep count of our strikes? He doesn't hold it against us. And Jesus understood who she was. And this amazing thing is the fact that he was going to transform her life. Amen. He was going to remind her. And so he models for us this this witnessing ability that Jesus has with grace and compassion and love, he begins to show. And the first thing we, we realize is that Jesus loves to connect with thirsty people. I understand they're, they're hanging around a well and Jesus was looking for water, but Jesus wasn't looking for water, was he? He was looking for the living water that only he could pour out, that only he could give. You know, we have to understand just what Jesus did. Jesus met people where they were. Yes. Jesus met people on their own turf. Jesus didn't wait for them to come to him. Matter of fact, if you look through the scriptures, uh, you know, I love this, this saying where you know, harvesters have to go to the field to harvest. Can you imagine if a farmer planted all this field and then went somewhere else to harvest? It'd be like, why? You go where the harvest is. That's why we have that saying, that scripture verse over the window as you look out and see the, the hillsides. And it says the harvest is ripe, right? We need, we need workers. We need the harvesters to go out. And, uh, you know, fishermen go where the fish are. You can fish in your bathtub, but it probably won't be very productive. Right? Somebody had said that fishing in your bathtub might be wonderfully convenient, but it's not highly effective. Right? And that's the difference between saying, well, I, the fish need to come to me, the harvest needs to come to me. No, you need to go where they are. And Jesus was showing this. You understand, in, in just the Gospels alone, Jesus had 132 encounters with people. Out of the 132 counters, do you understand that only six of them were in the temple? Only four of them were in the synagogue. And all the others were in their situations. Outside of 122 encounters Jesus had was where they lived. Amen. Now, he didn't wait for them to come to him. He went to them. And so we, we throw out all of our excuses, don't we? Well, I'm not an evangelist. Yes, you are. If you have a testimony, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you've been called to be an evangelist. Amen. You've been called to be part of the Great Commission. Yes. You have been called to do something beyond yourself, to take what God has given to you and to share those things. 10,000 people were surveyed in the Institute for American Church Growth, and they concluded that 79% began attending church because they were invited by a friend. Only 6% came because of the pastor. Only 5% came because of the ministries. And this will just kill you. Less than one half of a percent of people came because the church had an evangelistic crusade. Not effective. You know it's effective? Individual people asking and inviting a friend or a relative to come. You say, well, I ask people and they don't come. I don't want to be pushy. Well, that's another excuse I've heard people say. Well, I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to shove Jesus in people's face. 
And uh, another survey says that 65% of people would favorably come to an invitation if they were invited to come. But if a stranger invited them, it would be only 15%. 65% of people would come favorably to a, respond favorably to an invitation from a friend. Only 15% would respond from a stranger. And you're not heard people say, well, Pastor, did you go talk to them? I don't know them. You do. You have a 50% better chance of them responding to you than to me. Right? But you, don't, you think you're not an evangelist and you don't think that you're pushing. Right? You don't want to do that. But yet, look at the results of what happened. 65%. If there was 100 people that you invited, 65 of them would come to church with you. And they would respond favorably. But if I asked 100 people I didn't know, only 15% of them would come. Which means there's a great, a way bigger chance if you would invite them, that they would come and be here with you. They would say, well, I don't know any non-Christians. Are you kidding me? They're all over the place. <laughs> I believe you, maybe you don't hang out with them. Maybe that's not your clique. Maybe that's, you know, not your hangout. But you know a lot of non-Christians. I guarantee if you have a job that's outside of the ministry, you are working with a lot of non-Christians. And right now, statistics tell us that the unchurched is growing more and more than it's ever been. There are more unchurched people today than there ever been. So if somebody's saying to me, I don't know any unchurched people, yet yes, you do. You know more than you, you think you do. Each of us have accepted that have accepted Christ as our Savior. We are commissioned to invite others to understand that grace that we've experienced. Right? Now look what love of Jesus did. Jesus crossed the barriers. Right? He says, I don't care if you're a woman, and I don't care if you're a Samaritan. All I care about is your spirit. All I don't only care about is your soul. What I really care about is you having a relationship with God the Father and being forgiven of your sins. The rest of the stuff doesn't really matter to Jesus. That was what his heart was. And I love the fact that the Assemblies of God is a worldwide missions uh, movement. Right? Because we believe that it's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, right? And the uttermost parts of the world. And I love that we support missionaries that are local, missionaries that are in Iowa, we support missionaries that are in the United States, and we support a whole lot of missionaries that are in the uttermost parts of the world. And I love that that's what the AG does, but as we go back and look at this woman, there are two really odd things about her behavior. And the first one is the fact that, that there was a well closer to her than the one she went to. She didn't have to go as far as she had to to get water. But on this day, and at this time, she came to a well that she had to walk further to get to than a well that was closer to her house. And she came at a time when nobody else would be there but her. It was going to be just her alone. How many times have you looked for opportunities? I can't tell you how many times I've gone with the purpose and the intent of, of evangelizing or witnessing or getting someone to say, I'm wanting to lead them to the Lord. And everybody and their brother starts showing up. I hear things like, oh, I haven't seen them in two years. Only the enemy would bring them to you at this moment in time, right? Because you want that one-on-one -on -one opportunity with no distractions, nobody else. And God set this up. She didn't have to go to this well. She could have went to a closer well. And because she came when nobody else was coming, it was just her and Jesus. What a great time to do that, Amen. And if Jesus ignored all the social barriers because he saw the value of this person. Yes. The value isn't what she's done. The value wasn't what her circumstances were. The value wasn't her past. The value was her future. Yes. Of where she could spend eternity. Of this hope that could be renewed. Right? And we look at, sometimes we have to cross religious barriers. We had to do that with my own mother. You know, because she grew up believing that their church was, if you didn't go to her church, you didn't get to heaven. And yet, we talked to her and realized they said, we're not asking you to leave your church. We're just asking you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what really is, is what's important. To understand what Jesus says you have to do in order to spend eternity with Him. Jesus isn't concerned, even with the disciples' opinions. Because the disciples show up later like, Jesus, what are you doing? Are you talking with a woman? And it's she's a Samaritan. We just went to get food. What has happened to you? And Jesus said, I don't really care what you think either. Because it's not about you. Right? People say to you, 
Well, what are they going to think of me? Who cares what they think of you? It all depends on what God wants you to do. Jesus was just consumed and compassionate about people. What did D.L. Moody was, was sharing and talking about evangelism and, and uh, he, was, he, he had said, he goes, I, you know, I, I, I try to do the best I can. And after the service, a lady came to him and she said, well, Mr. Moody, I want you to know, I don't like the way you do evangelism. He says, you know, I'm not a big fan of it either. He says, how do you do it? And she goes, I don't do it. He says, I like my way of not of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Isn't that true? So I, said, I, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Listen, Jesus compassionately shows people, but one of the things you have to do, and this is always the hard part, this is the part we really pray that the Holy Spirit is involved in, is the fact that we have to bring up the sin situation. What is Jesus saving us from? Because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Jesus in the midst of this conversation, this woman speaks and she goes, I don't have a husband. And those just sound like a few words to us, but Jesus understood that those words, she spilled her guts. She opened up and she said, you know, this is my pain. This is the guilt that I've been carrying, right? This is part of my existence. This is my sin. This is my failure. This is my rejection. This is my guilt, right? And she exposed it just by saying those five words. I don't have a husband. Revealing the fact, this is my problem. This is my hurt. Jesus doesn't speak the truth to her to condemn her. He speaks the truth to her because he says, I've got to bring you face to face with your sin. The whole purpose that I came to talk to you is the fact, I know that you're a sinner and you need my grace and you need my love and you need to be forgiven. He deals with the sin issue. We have to deal with the sin issue. We can't evangelize anybody until they come to an agreement, to a confession. And to confess literally means to agree with God, what I have done is wrong. And she begins to confess. And Jesus says, I need you to understand, you're not hopelessly bound to your past. You're not hopelessly bound to your, to your choices or to your circumstances. He says, I want to give you living water. What he's saying here is, I want to give you a new life. I want to give you a new hope. I want to give you forgiveness and I want to give you freedom. So Jesus touches on the sin subject, and you know what she does immediately? She wants to change the conversation. Whoa, we're going to talk about my sin? I just opened up, but you know what? I'm going to be a little basic. So she goes, so where is this place you guys worship? Where, where, do, you, where, do, you, where do you worship God? And she's probably being invasive. She's trying to change the subject, because when we talk about our sin, it's not a pleasant conversation. It's not pleasant between us and God, let alone with somebody else. But she turns around to this religious response that we've heard so often. Well, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to try harder. Uh, I'm going to fix what's wrong with me, and I'm going to be fine. And it's only after we try to do that we realize how deficient we are in fixing ourselves. Yeah. And it can't be done. And it's only at that point we realize I have only one hope, and that is to turn my sin over to the grace of God. Yeah. Jesus doesn't hold back on addressing the sin problem. The bad news, all of us have to do that. We all have to address that Romans... 323, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have done that. That's not a popular message. It's not a popular message when you're talking to your mother. Then God, how do I tell my mother she's a sinner? And yet honor her. Well, to not tell her would not be honoring to her. Or to God. But yet we have to deal with that issue. And it's part of what God does. It's essential to Christ's message. And so once Jesus lays open this, this business of the sin, then what he does, he says, but here's the answer. He goes, here's the answer. If you would have known who was asking you for water, you'd be asking him for living water. Yes. He says, now, we all understand we have a problem. You just admitted to the fact when you said that you don't have a husband, you just admitted to the fact that you were living in sin. He said, but I need you to know, I am the answer to your problem. I am the one who can fix this. I am the one who can help you and deliver you. So her response is simply, sir, I have perceived that you must be a prophet. You know all about me. You know who I am and what I've done. And she admits that she confesses that he's right. But all of a sudden, she no longer becomes evasive. She stands in agreement and she begins to express an honest plea for help. When you're talking with people and, and you get to the sin issue, right? 
Hopefully they get to a point where they say, yes, I have sinned. I, I have sinned and I need some help. And Jesus' answer was, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you'd be asking for living water. And what he said in that one statement was amazing. He was literally giving her everything she needed to be saved. He says, I need you to understand this is what you need. You need the water of life. You need living water, and it can only come from me. Only the water I offer to you can wash away sin. Amen. The water you get from this well maybe will quench your thirst, but it won't quench it for long, and you're going to have to come back and get more. But the living water I give to you, if you accept it and receive it, you will never thirst again. Yes. Your sins will be washed away as far as the east is from the west. And we have to deal with this issue when we get there. And he says, this is what I did. This is what I'm offering you. And then on that, he says, but this is who you get it from. From me. You only get it from Jesus. You can't get it from your works. You can't get it from earning points. You can't get it by doing more good things than bad things. He says, you can only get it from me. And then he told her how to get it. He says, all you have to do is ask him and then receive. Amen. All you do is have to ask me for it and you can have it. So it's amazing. In verse 10, he gives us this one statement and he tells her what it was, who controls it, and how to get it. And what does she do? She asks a question, which I believe just revealed this gaping hole in her heart that Jesus knew had to be filled. She goes, she goes where is God? Where is God? She goes, my people say he's on the mountain. Your people say he's in Jerusalem. She goes, I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. Of all the people hungry for God, a Samaritan. Right? Of all the people searching for God, a five-time divorcee. Of all the people wanting to receive the gift of grace, an outcast among outcasts. Yet the most insignificant person really in the region and yet, because she was hungry and thirsty for the things of God, yes. she had an encounter with Jesus, and her life was never the same again. Yes. And I don't know about you, but that's what propels me in ministry. Yes. To watch people receive the gift of God, and the glory of God, and the grace of God, and watch their lives never be the same again. Yes. And to read the whole story, when you get to verse 28, this is what's really amazing. When it gets to verse 28, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to her town. And wait a minute. The whole purpose that she came in the middle of the day was to get water. And you leave without your water jar. Isn't it amazing that the things we think are significance are insignificance once we have an encounter with Jesus Christ? The very thing she thought she needed the most, she left behind because she received everything she was ever, ever going to need the rest of her life. And so she left that water jar. She ran to the city. And what did she do when she got to town? She said she grabbed the very first person she could find. And she said to him, you've got to meet the guy that I just met. He knew everything about me. And he said that he loves me anyway. This woman who just got saved became one of the greatest evangelists to ever live. They say, why do you know that? I know that because verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans in that town, and I will add this part, who knew who she was, who knew her background, who called her a sinner, who wanted nothing to do with her, and probably publicly humiliated her. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. Yeah. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. She goes to town and says, you won't believe what just happened to me. And the people that saw her couldn't deny what happened to her. They didn't have to start talking about battling over scriptures or what's right and what's wrong and what we do. She just said, this is what Jesus did for me. I just had an encounter with him. And they couldn't deny the transformation they saw in this woman's life. Listen, if you're, I look around this room and I see a lot of lives that have been changed by the power of God. You have been transformed. A lot of you, I know your testimony. I know your story. I know your history. I know what God has done for you. That is the only thing this woman needed to change a whole community of believers. Just an encounter with Jesus Christ. And you and I have had that. 
we keep looking for more. We, have, we must need something else. We need to look at more. All you have to do is look around and see the people that have been rejected in society. Yes. Look around at the people that nobody else wants. Years ago, we went to a, a, a seminar, and, uh, oh, his name just escaped me. Tommy Barnett, thank you. You know what I'm talking about. Tommy Barnett had, had said he had a, a small church in Iowa. Uh, he moved to Davenport, which was just a, a 30 miles from, from where we were in Muscatine. And he went to a church called Westside and uh, started a ministry there. And as he was there, he began to pray. And one of the, he says, he shared with us, he says, one of the things I prayed, he says, God, I will take everybody nobody else wants. Yeah. He says, I don't care what kind of church that's going to look like or what kind of church that's going to be. But he told God, he says, I will take every person nobody else wants. Nobody else wants in their church. Nobody else wants in their neighborhood. Nobody else wants in their community. He says, I'll take them all. And his church began to explode. And he began to send out buses into the community. And it wasn't long his buses were driving by our church in Muscatine to pick up people. Apparently nobody else wanted there to take them all the way to Davenport I think you are driving past an Assembly of God Church to go to another Assembly of God Church, but God was blessing Pastor Barnett because that was his heart. Yes. And then he gets, he, he's moved out to California? No. Phoenix. Yeah, to Phoenix, Arizona. He's moved to Phoenix, and now he has a huge church. And it's amazing because when you come into the church, you think, why is there so much space between the first row of chairs and the, and the, and the, the pulpit? It's because they bring all the handicapped people and they line them all up before every church service. He says, I'll, I'll take anybody nobody else wants. That was a gutsy prayer. But you know what? He's doing amazing things. And amazing work. He says, we'll take everybody God nobody else wants. And sometimes you and I need to go to the people that nobody else wants to. Maybe the person nobody else is going to witness to. Maybe the person nobody else is going to talk to. Right? Maybe the person who everybody else is shunning. Maybe the person say, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to spend time with them because they're going to think that I'm part of what they do. Or I'm... Listen, Jesus didn't care. The disciples came back who knew him and said, what are you doing? You were talking to a woman. She's a Samaritan. She's a sinner. What is wrong with you? Right? Jesus says, she's a human who has a heart, who has a spirit, who needs to know the truth, who needs to be saved, who needs to know. There's a better life for her than what she's been living. Yes. And if you're not going to do it, I will. Amen. And then Jesus said, well, I will do what I have done. Yeah. And go do it more than I have done it. And do greater things than I have done. I want to challenge you as we close this morning with just really two things. Before you leave, we're going to pray. I'm going to want you to ask God, God, give me a Samaritan. Show me the name of a Samaritan. That woman that nobody wants, that man that nobody wants else to talk to. God, would you would you give me a name that you want me to go to and to witness and evangelize? That may be a gutsy prayer for you. Say, God, give me the name of a person. And maybe God won't give you the name. And if he doesn't give you a name, then I want the next answer, or the next question, or the next request in your prayer to be this. That God put me in the path of somebody who needs to hear who you are. Let me run into somebody. Maybe it'll be a well. Maybe it'll be noon. Maybe it'll be a time that's awkward for both of us. But God, would you give me an opportunity to witness before you? And I need you to commit to praying actively for that people. And uh, I know it's not easy. But listen, when we impact people with, for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, there is nothing more encouraging than doing that. Nothing better than asking, and I'll tell you this, not every woman, not every person, not every Samaritan that we talk to is going to give you the same results of what Jesus had in this well. But you know what? It's still important for us to plant the seeds. Yeah. See, some are going to plant seeds. Yeah. Some are going to water. Yeah. And some are going to bring them to harvest. Yeah. You may never know what you're doing. You may just be planting the seed. And you may walk away going, no, that didn't work. Yeah, it did. Yeah. You planted the seed. You may have watered the seed that somebody else was planted that maybe was sitting idle for a long time that needed just a little bit of water for it to start growing to fruition. And maybe you're the one who comes along and you get to reap the harvest. 
and that's awesome. But you are never an evangelistic failure if you planted the seed, if you wanted to see, or if you brought them to harvest. It's all part of the work of the kingdom. And who knows? Maybe there are people living today for Jesus Christ because somewhere along the line, you planted a seed in their heart. Amen. Maybe they came to know you because, came to know Jesus because you wanted something along the pathway of life. And you know what? That's not a failure. That was part of the process. Amen. And don't feel bad. So I, I did all that and I didn't get to lead with Jesus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What's the end result we want yes. for them to spend eternity with God? Yes. Who cares? Who does it as yes. long as it gets done? Amen. Yes. But be part of the process. Yes. Maybe it's the beginning, maybe in the middle, maybe you're going to get them at the end. But the part is doing your part. Yes. So I want to pray and ask the worship team to come back if they would. When we sang that first song, I thought, that's our ending song right there. <laughs> but your turn to ask that you buy your hands and pray with me this morning. First, we're going to do one, one, one business, and that is this. Jesus had an encounter with a woman that he knew had sinned. He knew everything about her. I have to tell you this morning, Jesus knows everything about you. He knows every sin you've ever committed, every word you've ever spoken, every action you've ever done. Jesus is privy to all of that. And yet he still loves you. But he loves you enough not to leave you in the condition or the situation or the circumstance that you're in today. Jesus wants to have an encounter with you like he did with that woman. It's not to convince you, it's to love on you. It's to remind you that we have all sinned. Nobody in this room is greater than anybody else because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So welcome, you are sitting around a group of people who have sinned as well. You are not the only one. But you happen to be here at this time this morning like Jesus and this woman just happened to be at the well at 12 o'clock. You are here at this moment of time because the Holy Spirit knew, he knew that you needed to be here to hear this message. And to know that maybe you felt hopeless. Maybe you felt like you can't go back. Maybe you felt rejected. Maybe you felt like you've been denied. Maybe you feel like you've lost all hope. I've got news for you this morning. Jesus loves you. He wants to restore your heart and your spirit and your mind. He wants to let you know it's not over. Because he loves you. And just like that woman, if you have a, a moment in time where you confess your sin, Jesus says, I am the answer. You ask me and I will forgive you. I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And in that moment of time, you will be set free. Set free from your past because the old will be gone and the new will come. It's not that you're never going to be challenged again. It's not that you're never going to hurt or you're never going to fail. It's the fact that it's, He's going to cleanse your spirit. Your spirit is what lives forever. And it's that moment of time that when your spirit is cleansed, God says, now you're mine. You've been adopted into my family. You are now a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords. But Jesus says this. This is how this works. He says, first you have to recognize and confess that you have sinned. Secondly, you have to ask me for my forgiveness. And third, you just simply receive. So then I'm going to ask you, if you're in the room this morning, you know that you have sinned. You need a Savior. And only Jesus can forgive you. I can't do it the person next to you. You can't do it yourself. You can't earn what God can do, you can only receive it. He died on the cross. He wouldn't have done that if you could do it yourself. Jesus died on the cross for you. Today, as you admitted the fact that you have sinned, your only hope and your only answer for eternity is Jesus. You see, it was Him, Him alone, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus said, the only way to heaven is me. That may be narrow-minded for what you think, but I can get news for you. That's how Jesus presented himself. He says, I'm your only way. And so he's it. He's our answer. You know your sin. You know Jesus is the answer. You put the two together, and then you simply ask him to forgive you. And 
I pray that right now that's what you're doing. Say, God, uh, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you forgive me? First John 1 9 says that Jesus is faithful to forgive when we confess. And not only do we forgive us, but he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So simply because we ask, Jesus responds and forgives. So if you admitted the fact that you're a sinner today, if you've asked Jesus to forgive you, the scripture says he is faithful to do what you just asked him to do. And right now, at this moment, you have been forgiven simply by the grace and the love and the mercies of God. And you are now a new person. The old is gone, the new has come. You have received from God what only God could give, and that's eternal life. A gift. And so as you've done that, as you've received it, maybe so Pastor, I don't feel any different. This is about your feelings, it's about the truth. Jesus says the truth sets you free. Simply because you have done this this morning, you have been set free by the love of God. And you have been redeemed. And you're now an heir to the throne. You become adopted into the very family of God. And it says that the angels in heaven are now celebrating around the throne room of God. And I think we need to celebrate as well. I hate to miss a good party. And right now, because of your prayer, there is a party going on in heaven. celebrating with you as well. And so if you made that decision this morning, if you confess that you have sinned, if you ask Jesus to forgive you, if you have just now received his grace, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to, I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand this morning so I can celebrate with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Anyone else?
Well, before you leave, we have one more prayer we've got to pray. And that is that God will speak to you a name yes. that He wants you to reach out to, that He wants you to pray about. I mean, God is good at that. I can't tell you how many times God said that to me. That's the first we need to go to. The God has it all prepared. He'll do all the work before you get there. Amen. He just wants you to go and be there. So we're going to pray and say, God, and I need you to pray. I don't, as your pastor, I don't want to just pray this prayer. I want you to pray. So I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Would you say, Dear Jesus, I have a song to sing. I have a song Because my heart is yours. Maybe I'm a nobody. But I need to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. So Lord Jesus, would you give me that name of the person that you want me to speak to? And Jesus, even if you don't give me a name, I'm going to ask you to give me an encounter with someone who needs to know 